I was told to thank the punctual people. Thank you all. Cool, cool. All right, well, as people are shuffling in, I want to go ahead and say welcome. Uh, my name is Caitlin, and I want to welcome you all to Christ the King. We are a church on a mission to cultivate a community of disciples that abide in Christ the King. So welcome especially to our visitors, and I hope that you uh, will grab a gift from the welcome table on your way out. We would love to give that to you just as a token of our gladness that you've joined us this morning. So please be sure to grab a bulletin. If you do not have one already, they're located on the tables right here as you come in. Um, and I have one announcement that I would like to direct your attention to. Um, <clears throat> our community groups are relaunching for the spring semester today. Community groups are mid-sized groups of all ages that meet regularly to get to know one another, discuss the Bible, and serve in the local community. Our groups meet across a large area. So some meet immediately following the service, others come back later this afternoon. If you aren't plugged in, we'd love for you to find a group that meets you, that uh, fits with you. Um, if you have any questions about that or any other announcements that you see in the bulletin, please uh, uh, see Terry at the Got Questions table right here at the entrance and she'd be happy to help. So with all of that said, let me uh, lead us in prayer as we open our time of worship. Father, we um, come here with gratitude and thankfulness that you call us to worship you. I pray that you would calm our hearts and receive our worship, um, Lord, that you prepare us to be present in this place, in this moment, um, that we would hear your word uh, and be sensitive to your spirit. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, please stand as I read the call to worship. <clears throat> the Lord calls us to worship from Psalm 100, verses 1 through 5. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Let's worship him. Come into his presence with singing this morning.
please. My name's Alita, and I'm going to be leading us in our confession to sin, of sin. <clears throat> our um, call to confession is from John 3, verse 17. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. I was just thinking this week how we are not under condemnation, and God in his mercy has given us not what we need not what not i mean not what we deserve not what we've set ourselves up for but what we don't deserve is which is his mercy so join me in confessing our sins together gracious god you know what kind of people we are we judge others harshly and fail to see our own sin we look with suspicion and fear and neglect to show hospitality to strangers. We treasure things that are worthless and squander your precious gifts. We withhold the grace and love that you give us so freely. Forgive us, pour out your grace upon us and heal us of our brokenness. Amen. Please silently confess your sins. Amen. Now hear the assurance of the gospel from John 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Stand again and sing of Jesus. Say 
I will read the parts not in bold. And uh, if you will read the, um, the parts in the bold with me, that would be great. And I'm glad that y'all figured out to sit down on your own. I forgot to say that. So um, that's on the checklist. So let's get going. I'm going to read uh, Psalm 32, 6. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. Almighty God, who is from everlasting to everlasting, grant us amid the conflicts of this passing world the comfort of a perfect trust in you. Save and help us, O Lord. From pride, selfishness, greed, and anger, from passions that lead to war among brothers and sisters in Christ, as well as war among nations, save and help us, O Lord. Let us pray for peace. Amen. As you have blessed our nation so richly, we pray for the president and all in authority over us, that they would lead us with wisdom and truth. Save and help us, O oh Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let us pray for those uh, who lead. Amen. For all who are afflicted by war within themselves, by the conflicts of doubt, a rebellious will, and the darkness of despair, save and help us, O Lord. Let us pray for all who struggle with the gospel. Amen. For all who suffer, the sick, the poor, and the prisoner, that they would be touched by your compassion and in their time of need, save and help us, O Lord. Let us pray for all who suffer. Amen. And now as our Savior taught us, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. Good morning again, everyone. Uh, Happy New Year. Uh, My name's Buck. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm so glad that you've come to worship with us at Christ the King uh, this Sunday. I have a few announcements for you before we get started. Um, The first is, uh, on the inside aisles of each of these sections, there's a little blue book. If you'll take that and pass it down the aisle and sign it and put your information on there and then pass it back to where it started, that would be great. Uh, That's just a way for us to know how to best minister to you, who's here. And if you're new, we really would like to write you a note and thank you for coming to our worship service today. If it is the first time that you've been here, we're so happy that you've come. Uh, There is a gift outside for you. We'd love for you to grab that. And if you're you're worshiping with us on live stream this morning, we're really happy that we have that medium for folks. Um, We know we have folks that are sick during the season and that can't be here, but we would love for you, whenever you can, to come and join our community uh, and be a part of what we're doing here on Sunday morning. So welcome to those who are joining by the live stream. I have one very important message for you, okay, that is an announcement. Two eyes, one buck. This is very important this morning, okay? Next Sunday, we will not be worshiping here in the morning. All right, that's very important. The 14th, Uh, We will not be worshiping here in the morning. Uh, There are some times during the springtime in particular that this venue is already booked and we cannot 
worship here. And so what we're going to do is instead of having a service here that morning, we are going to have a service at another sister church in the evening next week, which is Grace Community Church. It's right up Friendship Road uh, where it intersects with 985. Uh, it's not very far from here, maybe five minutes, eight minutes. And so we're going to worship there next Sunday at 5 p.m., and there will be child care. Everything will be just as it is on a Sunday morning. We're going to do everything the same. It'll just be in a different venue, and it'll be in the evening. So we'll look forward to that. If you know people that are having, have a hard time coming to church on Sunday morning, it'd be a great time for you to invite them to what we're doing. Uh, but we look forward to worshiping together next uh, Sunday evening. So make sure that you have that on your uh, calendar. Um, we have been doing, uh, we're starting a new sermon series as the year begins. I know that some of you received the pastoral letter that I sent out this past week uh, about how we're thinking deeply about our church and what the next steps are or the next chapter is going to be in the life of our church. Uh, we went through a lot last year. We went from being a church plant to what we call a particular church or may, maybe a puberty church might be the better word for it because we're, we're not quite a large church. We're not quite a small church plant anymore. We're something different. But our leaders for the last six months have been thinking very hard about what direction Christ the King wants to move in as we start this new phase of our church life. And um, we've been, we've tried to think about that through the grid of abiding. If you look in your bulletin, you'll see we have our, our church uh, mission statement there written in the bulletin underneath the sermon. It's to cultivate a community of disciples that abide in Christ the King. If you've been here very long at all, you know we talk about abiding all the time, uh, which is connection or communion with Jesus Christ. And so we've been thinking a lot about what that means in terms of our, our community being near Jesus, abiding in Jesus, but where that leads, what the evolution of that will be in our lives. And so the next three weeks, I'm going to be preaching some sermons about what we're going to call the evolution of abiding, where it takes us in our lives. We'll start that this week by looking at Hebrews chapter 10. I hope that'll help you to think about your own life, your family, what it looks like for someone like you to connect and commune with Jesus, but where that leads you in your life. So if you will, let me pray for us and ask God to help us think well about that. And then uh, I think Ray is going to come read the scriptures for us. So let's pray together. Father, um, we uh, desperately need your help. We want to know you more. As the year begins, we think back on 2023 about how uh, life was just not always like what we wanted it to be. And I pray that you would help us to think deeply today about what it looks like for people like us to be loved by you, uh, to be delighted in by you, to be cared for by you. And Lord Jesus, as you open our hearts up to that, that you would lead us to what's next, lead us to read the next chapter that you've written for us. So please help us. We need your mercy. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing the next song, uh, kids uh, in grades two through five can be dismissed to their discipleship group out this door here, and they will come back in at the end of the service during the communion time. Stand together, please. By the long before creation, thou hast chosen us in love and that love so deep so moving draws us close to Christ above still it keeps us still it keeps us only fixed in Christ alone though the world may
God so loved us, God so loved us, that His only Son He gave. Loving Father, now before Thee, we will ever praise Thy love, and our songs will sound unceasing. That is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from all evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Thank you, Ray. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever been to a wedding, or perhaps you've seen this uh, feat of marvel at, uh, on a television show or something like this, but uh, sometimes they'll have champagne glasses that are stacked up in sort of a pyramid. Have you seen this? To the very top. And someone uh, pours the champagne in the top champagne glass, and it overflows to the one sitting underneath it, and then overflows to the one sitting underneath it. And down and down and down it goes until all the glasses are filled, right? It's kind of a marvel, a, a fun party trick. But I've thought a lot about that particular dynamic as I've read this passage this week. Because what you see here is this picture of how Jesus connects with us, how Jesus uh, communes with us, and as his love sort of flows into our lives, it then flows out into the lives of the people closest to us. And as it flows into their life, it then flows out of their lives into the people closest to them. And we see this dynamic of love sort of overflowing in the life of the church because of Jesus' deep love that he's poured into us. And so I want to talk to you this morning about that dynamic, about what it looks like to be poured into by Jesus in this passage. But then I also want to look at what it looks like for you to have that love and what it looks like for us as a church to overflow that same love to our neighbors and those around us. All right, that's where we're going to go today as we think a little bit about, once again, the evolution of abiding. Being connected to Jesus, experiencing and knowing his love leads to loving our neighbors well. So first of all, what does it mean to be poured in? Okay, poured into by Jesus. This union that we've, we've talked about with Jesus for a very long time, being connected to him. Well, what we see in this passage is that leads to us having this extreme confidence in our lives and this extreme feeling of being cared for. Let me explain that by looking at the passage. At the very beginning, you see, it says, uh, therefore, is the first word that you see. And when uh, you're reading the Bible and you see the word therefore, you've heard this little jingle maybe in your life, but you should ask, what's the therefore, therefore? All right, why is it, what is it pointing us to? It's pointing us back to previous places that, we've, that you might have read in the book of Hebrews. And one of the central themes in Hebrews is uh, about priests, you know, that's a strange thing. We don't talk a lot about priests today, but Old Testament priests were the ones who cared for God's people in some pretty 
odd and specific ways. One way they cared for God's people is by making sacrifices for them. They sacrificed animals for the sins that they committed so that they may be forgiven of their sins. Um, A second way that they did it was by ministering the blessings of God to them. They would speak God's blessings to the people, encouraging them about their own forgiveness, encouraging them about what it means to be connected to God. It's, It's sort of like the priest stood between the people and God and mediated the relationship between them. Um, An example of this that you might have seen in real life or in TV shows is a confession booth that you've seen that the Catholic Church often has where a a pastor, a priest, sorry, sits on one side and the congregant comes in and they confess their sins. And this sort of mediation happens because they confess their sins to the priest and the priest then... uh, can, it conveys that to God and conveys what it would mean to make right those sins to the person. And so there's this, they, they run sort of interference between God and the person. Now, what the, the book of Hebrews teaches us, what the author has kind of said beforehand that he's pointing to with this therefore, is the good news that Jesus was the final priest. He was... Uh, the one who gave his own life on the cross, a permanent and final sacrifice for people, so we don't have to sacrifice animals anymore. And now he actively mediates between us and God, uh, bestowing God's blessing upon us, talking, showing us God's blessing in unique ways, and also uh, sending our prayers to the Lord in pleasant ways. I'll explain that a little bit more in a minute. So in light of this, therefore, the author conveys that there are two blessings that have come to God's people through the priestly work of Jesus. Jesus is our priest, and because of that, there are these two blessings that come to them. The first is that we now have confidence to enter into God's presence in our lives. We see this in the the very uh, beginning where it says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus— by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh or his body. Um, He's showing this picture of how the church now, God's people, have confidence. Because Jesus is the priest that stands between us and God. Let me explain what that means. Um, There's this uh, image that happens when Jesus is crucified in the Bible. It says that Jesus was hanging on the cross... And when he breathed his last, it sort of changes the the camera angle and shifts to the temple. And something is happening in the temple when that occurs. The temple was this building that people would go to to worship God. And it had these chambers inside. And the chamber that was on the the innermost of the, the temple was called the Holy of Holies. And that particular room had this enormous curtain that separated it from the rest of the building, where you could not go in through the curtain. And the curtain was enormous. It probably ran as high as the ceiling of this room down. It was this thick uh, fabric and gold that were woven together. Some say that it was probably as thick as a phone book, if you know what a phone book is anymore. You know, it was about that thick. It was enormous. And once a year, one priest, the high priest, would go through that curtain and make a sacrifice for all the people in this holy place. Inside the holy place was the Ark of the Covenant, as well as some other accoutrements that they used to make this big sacrifice each year for the people. And so it was the room that people would go into where God's holiness, His presence would dwell in this amazing way. It would say that His glory would settle down and sit on the Ark in this amazing way, So much so that no one could go in except for this priest one time of year in order for uh, this sacrifice to be made. And when Jesus is hanging on the cross and he's crucified, there's this camera shift that goes over to the temple into that room. And it says that that curtain, that enormous thick curtain, was torn in half from the top to the bottom. Right? Which signifies, of course, what? Who tore it? God tore it. God tore this curtain that we couldn't possibly tear with human hands, and it's torn from the top to the bottom, from heaven to earth, signifying something special, which was what we read here, where it says that we have confidence to enter into holy places by the blood 
of Jesus, that Jesus has made a way for us to go into these places that now we have access to God that we did not have before because of Jesus's being between us and God, being a mediator, right? I had a seminary professor that also said, consequently, about that ripping of the temple veil in two, that not only does it signify that we have access to God's holy places, but now God is out. He no longer dwells in temples built by the hands of men. Where does he dwell now? He dwells in our hearts. He's as close as anything can be to us because of the work, once again, of Jesus. And so the author of Hebrews is telling us because Jesus has served as this priest in between, now we have this amazing confidence that we can come before God with. Uh, and that confidence can look a lot of different ways, but it can look like a couple of things that I just thought of recently, which is um, we can now be honest with God about our fears, our frustrations, even with him, with our hurts, with our deepest needs, that now we can go to God. There's, there's no obstruction anymore. There's no holding back between us and him. It also means that we can live bravely in our lives and transparently with one another uh, because uh, Jesus has forgiven us of our sins. Uh, it's, it's like the difference now between being par paroled. You know what it means to be paroled? That you're out of prison because of the crime you committed, but you're being watched all the time, right? <laughs> because you can always get back in trouble and go back in. Or being pardoned, which is means that you're completely forgiven of your crime and there's no chance of you going back in for that ever again. That's the difference now because of the sacrifice, one, one sacrifice for all that's been made by Jesus. So now we have this confidence with him that we didn't have before. And he also says that we have uh, now Jesus as sort of a permanent minister to us. Look at what it says in verse 21. It says, and since we have a great priest now over the house of God, what that's conveying is now that Jesus, Jesus not only uh, makes uh, us right with God in the sense that we have confidence with him and he's made, given us access to him. But now he is the one that is sort of the mediator or the minister of God's blessings to us going forward. Jesus now represents us before God, acting as our advocate and our friend. He assures us of God's love for us and he helps us as we commune with God, which we all struggle with. But that's Jesus' role now is that he sits between us and God and helps us commune with God in that sense. Um, uh, an example of this uh, that I, I think I may have used this illustration last year a little bit, but I think it's helpful here, is about how we pray. Uh, there was once a little girl, and uh, she uh, loved her daddy very much. And she wanted to do something nice for him. So she went outside in the yard and, uh, and found a little daisy, and she picked it, right? And she says, I'm going to take this to daddy. And she reached out and she said, I'm going to take some other things. And so she picked some grass, put it with it. And she picked some uh, brambles and some thorns and put it with it. And she picked some poison ivy, uh-oh, and some poison sumac and put it in the bouquet and was going to run in and take it to her dad. And as she's running in to take it to him, her mom sees her and goes, hey, 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 what are you doing? Come show me. And she goes, I, I picked these flowers for daddy. And uh, she said, well, that is such a great and wonderful thing you want to do. Let's do some work on it and make it even more beautiful. And so the mom brings them in and she picks out the briars and the grass and the brambles and the poison ivy and the poison sumac. She takes the daisy and drops it in a vase with a dozen roses. And she gives it to her and says, go in and take this to your dad. And her dad was so pleased. And that's a picture of what happens to us every time we pray. Jesus sits between us and God and makes our prayers, which are often selfish, cruel, angry, frustrated, and he makes them beautiful and takes them to the Father. And the Father delights in our prayers and answers them, right? So that's just a picture of what that intercession, him being this priest in the household of God, looks like for us. And what that means is that now we can live uh, and rest in that mediation, rest in what he does, that no matter our sins, our sufferings, our circumstances, we can still go to God in prayer. We're never alone. He's always with us. We have nothing to fear, nothing to lose, and nothing to prove with him 
Because Jesus is our advocate with God. Jesus is standing between us. So that's just a little picture of what it looks like to be poured into here. All right? That the love of Jesus has been poured into us as his people. And the author of Hebrews wants you to see it. He wants you to embrace it. He wants you to take it in and say, okay, I, I, this is good news. <laughs> I have a lot to be thankful for. A lot has been, uh, have been blessed by this, partic- this work that Jesus has done for me. And of course, the question we ask then is like, what do I do? I, I'm this receptacle of this really good love that comes from God. What happens now? And the answer is, is that just like that first champagne glass, you overflow. All right? It comes out of you into your family or into your workmates or into your friends. It comes out of you. You're poured into and it's poured out. It's an overflow. And so our opportunity is that we abide in Jesus now, that we commune with him. Our response is abiding, which is what we talk about here quite often. Um, I've used this illustration before. I'm going to use it again because I've been asked to by people. Um, uh, union with Jesus looks something like this. This is you. This hand is you, all right, and me. And this hand is Jesus, all right? And Jesus comes into our life, and he takes us for himself. He gives up his life. He holds on to us tightly and will not let us go. He says, I'm going to love you to the bitter end, to the time that you are with me in the kingdom, and everything is made right. And most of the time, our response to this is, let me go. Get off of me. I don't want this. I don't like being held. I don't like being taken a hold of. But sometimes in our lives, this is what happens. All right? This is union. This is communion. It's abiding. All right? That's the picture that we have. And in this passage, the author of Hebrews talks to us about what that looks like. He gives us sort of three images of what that looks like. And he does it by saying, in light of what Jesus has done, let us do these things. Let us abide. And he talks about letting us abide in three different ways. I don't know if you caught it in the text. Look at it with me. In verse 22, he says then, since we have this great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. All right, so first of all, we learn that abiding is coming to Jesus. It's drawing near him, all right? And we come, we now can come to God because we see the surety of Jesus' love for us and his ministry to us. We can now come to God because our hearts, it says here, have been cleaned by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, there's nothing obstructing us from going to him. And that's why he asks us, implores us, says, let us draw near to him. Let's get closer to Jesus. How do we do that? We talk about this all the time. We draw near to Jesus by worshiping him. When you came to this room, you said, I want to draw near. We draw near to Jesus by praying to him. When you wake up in the morning and you give thanks for something, or when you're in the car and you're nervous and you ask God to help you, uh, you are drawing near. You're closer to him than you were before. Oftentimes we have this really weird idea about being a disciple of Jesus, which means, that, which is uh, destinational. We think uh, I am, uh, the way to be a disciple is to, is to like be okay for Jesus to fix me and then I'm where I'm supposed to be for the rest of my life. But really, the, the better way, that the, the biblical way to think about discipleship is not destinational. I have a place I'm trying to get to, but directional. Like, which, where am I moving in my life? Am I moving toward Jesus or away from him? And we see this oftentimes in our lives. That a person who's been a Christian for 20 years may not be moving toward him. A person who is not a Christian may be moving toward him. The idea about discipleship is to move toward him, to draw near to him, to try to get close to him, that we are, we believe that we are changed by proximity. By being close to Jesus, we are made whole. So we we draw near by worshiping, by praying, by taking his word into our lives, but also by being with other people that know him, by being in a community of faith, we're transformed by what he does. So 
First of all, abiding is coming to Jesus. Let us draw near. Secondly, abiding is staying with Jesus. Look with me in verse 23. He says, Let us hold fast the confession of hope without wavering, for he who is, prom who is promised is faithful. The word abide in the Bible can also be trans uh, translated to remain or to stay. Think about that in regards to Jesus saying, abide with me. He's saying, stay. Here we learn that uh, part of the faith is holding fast to what we believe and trusting in God's faithfulness, even when we're tempted to give up on him or when we're persecuted or when we're afraid. And we're all wildly uh, uh, out of touch with reality if we don't think there are times where we don't feel that way, where we don't have doubts, when we're scared, when we don't know. And what he's saying here is that abiding is not just coming to him, but it's staying with him. How do we stay with him? Well, we stay with Jesus by staying in proximity to him, by putting ourselves in the best possible position to be changed by his grace. We stay with him by working through our doubts and our fears with him or with his people rather than hiding from him or giving up on him. The Bible is replete with these refrains over and over again. Don't leave. Stay. Work it out. Let's work through it. And many of us are going through situations in our lives where it would just be easier to get out. The church aggravates us. It's hard. It's not a perfect institution. It's frustrating. We've all been through difficulties in churches. And the easier thing to do would just be to get out and to go home and sleep in on Sundays, right? But Jesus is saying part of abiding is to stay, to believe that as he sits between us and God, that he is making amazing things happen in the world, that he is bringing his kingdom here. And we can trust him even when we don't trust our own hearts. So first of all, abiding is coming to Jesus. Second of all, abiding is staying with Jesus. And then here's the, the wild evolution of abiding, the third one that he says. He says in verse 24, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. All right. What does this mean? Let us... Let us uh, figure out how to stir each other up. Huh. Abiding is lastly, uh, learning to provoke like Jesus does. All right? It's drawing near to Jesus. It's staying with Jesus. And it's learning how to provoke like Jesus. Let me explain what that means. Uh, here we learn that the outworking of, or the evolution of abiding is not just being in groups where we learn how to stay near Jesus or lo love, more, love Jesus more or learn more about Jesus or finding new insights about Jesus. But the outworking of abiding is to love. Like if you are a healthy Christian, you should be, love should flow out of you into the lives of other people. That's the point. When we first started this church, we said we're going to focus on being healthy. We want people to know Jesus. We want people to connect with Jesus. We want to provide avenues and accountability for people to have that because we knew if people did it, love would come out. That's the way it works. If you're consistently understanding, knowing the love of Jesus in your life, it will come out of you. Okay? It will be an unstoppable force in the world. Uh, we we, uh, we talk a lot early on in the church plant about how, you know, if you're in an airplane and the cabin depressurizes, the oxygen masks fall, and the instructions are always what? To take an oxygen mask and do what? You put it on yourself first, right? You put it on yourself first. And we talk about that all the time, that you have to take care of yourself. You have to be someone who's healthy in the faith. And that means connecting with Jesus all the time, finding ways to do that, abiding in him. But it also means once you're breathing, that you take another one and you put it on somebody else, Right? That's the idea. That's the evolution, right? It's not that you just hog the oxygen when <laughs> the plane's going berserk. It's you share the oxygen when you can breathe. And that's the picture we see here. And the author of Hebrews uh, describes this in a really profound way, uh, that we should stir each other up. Now, this is weird because stirring up in the Bible most of the time is negative. It, uh, it's used in like two or three places to describe stirring up a hornet's nest. All right? Or like a storm stirring up the waters and making them choppy, all right? And then it's also used, of course, to describe stirring up anger or trouble or discontent among people. It's often used 
in, in that sort of way as well. But he's using it in a positive way. He's uh, hijacking a negative term and using it to demonstrate the imperative of stirring each other up. And so he's using this phrase to describe us as people in the church provoking each other to love our neighbors and to do good. That's the goal. Jesus abiding, the evolution of it is to provoke each other, to stir each other up, to needle each other, to do good, and to love each other, and to love our neighbors. Um, in our staff meeting earlier this week, we talked about this passage, and one of the people in the staff said it, the, the idea of stirring up reminded him of a football team coming in at halftime, being behind, and the coach giving like one of those fiery messages to the team, you know, to get them to play harder and better in the second half, right? Because he wants them to go out and win. That's the picture is that uh, we as the church are called to like fire each other up, to give halftime speeches to each other, to do good, and to love those people around us when we're tempted just to turn inward and love ourselves, to pull our garage doors down, right? Do you give halftime speeches to your friends? right? Would you do that to me? Would you please start giving me halftime speeches about the gospel? That would be so wonderful. The funny thing is, is Jesus did this all the time. Um, he stirred up crowds and made them feel uncomfortable because of their self-reliance or their self-love. Uh, he pushed his disciples all the time to see their need and to place their hope in God and to love other people outside of themselves. He, he provoked the religious people all the time at the, uh, to stop burdening people with laws and to love them. <laughs> yeah, I think one of the chief things he wanted from the Pharisees, his consistent rebuke of the Pharisees, is that he wanted them to love. He, they understood the, the Bible. They, they understood the good news as well as anyone, but they didn't love people. And he wanted that to be the evolution in their life. He's con his, he was consistently frustrated with them because of this. So all of this provocation in Jesus' life was the fruit of his relationship with the Father. And think about it. Jesus drew near to the Father all the time. He stayed close to the Father, even when he was tempted to do otherwise. And he overflowed with love into people's lives. He is the ideal for the evolution of abiding, right? He's showing us with his life. He's the archetype of abiding for us. So how do we begin to provoke each other toward love? I don't want you to be mean to each other, unless it's necessary, right? Uh, but he gives us some examples here in verse 25, and this is how we're going to end. I want to look at three examples that he gives us at the end about how we do this practically. The first thing he says here is um, stir each other up to love and good works not neglecting to meet together. Isn't that weird that that's the first thing he says? Not neglecting to meet together. So our worship, our groups, our teams, our friendships, our gatherings are all places for us to provoke one another to love. That's the point. That we want to provoke one another with the gospel to love. Meeting together is not merely for you to consume. Our gatherings are an opportunity to stoke love. You know, like taking coals and stoking them to get hot again. That's the picture we want. And oftentimes, uh, in our gatherings, there are opportunities to stoke one another to strife. But he's calling us to stoke one another to love. How do we do that? Well, look at what he says next. Uh, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. Encouraging one another. Think about this. Is your posture toward others one primarily of criticism or encouragement? How do you typically face the world? If people were to describe you, would they say that you're an encourager or would they say that you're a, a critic? Here, in, in other places in Hebrews, by the way, there's a Hebrews 3.13, which is one of my favorite verses, uh, it says, to encourage one another as long as the day is called today that you may not harden your hearts in the deceitfulness of sin. Wow. Think about that. So encouragement is the vocalization of love. 
we have a great introduction to it. I want to read a, a few verses to you from Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verses 10 through 11. This is like a, a picture of what uh, a, an encouragement, a, an encouraging community looks like. It says this, uh, Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Don't be slothful in your zeal, but be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show them hospitality. You see how the picture is, once again, the love is coming to you and it's flowing out now. And it looks like people who want to show honor and commend the commendable in one another. Encouragement means to commend the commendable in others. Showing this honor with zeal is one of the most important things we can do for one another because like we said earlier, the author of Hebrews teaches us that like by encouraging each other, you prevent one another from having hard hearts. Like it's, it's like tilling up fertile ground all the time when we encourage one another. Um, and we're given the incredible power to speak love and life into each other, even though it may not benefit us, we could speak it into other people. And just think for a moment about the last time somebody encouraged you. Like, what did it do to you? How did it feel to you to be encouraged in that way? I had a minister send me a text message this morning saying, like, I'm just praying for you with your, uh, with, that you're going to, uh, your new initiative and prayer and the things that you're doing in your church, I'm praying for you this morning. I just want you to know that. He doesn't come here. And it just fills you up. You know, you can feel love filling you when that happens. Another form of encouragement is calling other people to future possibilities, um, to name a talent that they have, but at the same time exhort them to steward it and to multiply it in their life. Um, I can think of several examples. I can remember when I was in college, I had a friend named Matt uh, who was really close to me. He knew me about as well as anybody else. We went on a camping trip one time uh, and we were in a tent and we were just talking. And he says, you know, Buck, I know you don't do this very much, but I think you're a really good teacher of the Bible. I think you need to do that more. How can I help you do that more? You see what he did? He took something that he saw in me that I didn't see in myself, and he encouraged me to use it and multiply the gift for the sake of the good of others and love of others. Um, I'm very thankful for the way he does that all the time. And can you think about when you were a kid, perhaps? Think about all the kids in the room next door. What it means for an older person to say, I'm proud of you. You did a really good job. You know, you're really, really good at that. You should do that more. I'm really thankful for the way you're doing these things. Like it, it just fills you up. That's what encouragement is meant to do, is to fill us with love. And the last little thing we see in the passage at the end here is he says, uh, to meet together, provoke each other that way, to encourage one another, and then to do this all the more as you see the day approaching. What does that mean, to see the day approaching? Well, what he means is that there's going to be a time when this priest is not going to sit between us anymore. He's going to come out and he's going to come down. And he is going to make this world what it's meant to be. He is going to fix what's broken here. He's going to dry every tear and he is going to vanquish death forevermore. And he is going to make all the sad things come untrue, right? And that day is not a warning for us. It is a motivation for us. We get to participate in Jesus' future restoration project as we gather together, as we encourage one another about the hope that we have in him. Um, during the holidays, uh, you know, they'll just run movies. And so our family's been all together the last few weeks. And uh, of course, Avengers Endgame comes on one day. I don't know how many of you are Marvel fans, but I've probably seen Avengers Endgame 20 times. You know, two or three intentionally, and then other times it just comes on TV, you know. I'm not intentionally watching it. But you get drawn in. It's a great movie. Um, and so Caitlin and I are watching it, and we've literally seen it 20 times, right? And there are these moments where they're in trouble, like this, this bomb hits a building, and they all kind of get thrown down in the building at the end, and we're just nervous, We've seen it 20 times. We know how it ends, but we're still nervous, right? But it makes watching it all the more fun because you know there's going to be this moment at the end when things are going to be made right, right? It makes getting through the hard parts tolerable, more tolerable because you know how the movie is going to end. 
And Jesus is telling us here to remember and recount often his work for us as we see this day approaching, that we might be motivated to love, to overflow what's been poured into us. So let's ask him for help. Can we do that? Can we ask God to turn us outward, to begin that process of evolving, uh, abiding from not just coming to him, not just uh, staying with him, but also uh, for his love to flow out of us and provoke one another toward goodness for our neighbors. Let's pray and ask him for that as we close. Father, thank you so much for your kindness to love us the way that you have loved us. We are incredibly, incredibly grateful for the work that you have done in our hearts and in our minds. We thank you that you stand between us and the Father and you make us pleasing to him and you make his blessings and beauty available to us. We thank you that you want us to be near you, that you want us to stay, that you want us to stir each other up and provoke each other to do good. Would you help us to want that more and more this year? Would you open up our hearts in 2024 to love in ways that we have not been open to it before because we are being poured into? And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, you can pick up your uh, kids uh, in uh, second through fifth grade uh, and bring them back in for our communion time. Let's respond in song, singing to our great God. Stand together, please. God of his hand, occupy my lowly heart, own it all and reign supreme, on the every level part. Let no vice or sin remain, but resist your holy Please be seated. It's now the time in our service where we come to the Lord's table, which is another way that we're reminded each week of this love that Jesus had for us. Jesus was with his disciples and he left this meal. He had this meal with them and then he reminded them to keep coming back to this, to keep uh, taking these elements 
uh, that they may be reminded of his kindness and the depths of love that he has for them. So today, uh, we're going to come to the Lord's table again and be reminded of his love in hopes that once again, it would flow out of us into the lives of those around us. Uh, A couple of things I need to let you know about this meal before we take it that the Bible asks me as a minister to convey to you. The first is that this is a meal for those who are... uh, know Jesus Christ, who have received him as their king. If you don't know Jesus today, then I want to urge you not to take this meal, but instead to wait, uh, to think deeply about where your faith is, and possibly put your faith in him today. There are uh, prayers in your bulletin that might help you with that. Also, in the back, the Shackleford's will be in the back a little bit later in the service, and they'd be happy to pray with you about that. Uh, Also, the Bible warns us that because this is a meal for a family, for those who are in the family of the faith, uh, that it's also sort of a a crossroads each week for us to think about our sin. And that if we have sin in our life that we have uh, been unwilling to let go of, that has its claws deeply in us and we will not repent of, then we're warned not to take the supper, but instead to deal with those sins first. And those could look like having a broken relationship with someone uh, that you're unwilling to forgive them, uh, that you're unwilling to work through a difficulty with them. So I ask you to consider those things too as we come. For the vast majority of us, though, this is a place for us to draw God's grace into our lives. For once again, to be poured into by him, uh, for us to realize his love again as we remember his life, his death, and his resurrection. So let me pray for us and ask God to come and bless us as we receive this sacrament. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful for your uh, uh, kind will to leave us this meal. Another way, Lord, for us to know your grace. We've heard it preached. We've sung it. We've prayed it. And now we get to taste it. Thank you, Father, for that. Would you now lift up our hearts into the heavenly realms and help us to celebrate (laughs) Jesus' life and death with you. In his name we pray, amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was with his disciples and he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant of forgiveness in my blood. Take and drink of it, all of you. Do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, let us keep the feast. We come not because we are strong, but because we are weak. We come not because we are whole, but because we are broken. We come not because we are righteous, but because we are repentant. We come not because we ought, but because we may. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come and receive them, remembering that Jesus both lived and died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith. Um, If those who would serve will come forward at this time, I want to give you a few words of instructions about how uh, we take the Lord's Supper here at Christ the King. Uh, First of all, there are three stations that you see up front, the two black tables and this one in the center. Uh, We ask folks to come forward and receive uh, communion at each of those tables from those who are serving. You'll see there are trays at each table that have double stacked cups. The, The cups on the outside of the tray have wine in them. The cups on the inside of the tray have grape juice in them. And you'll notice that they are double stacked. Okay? On the bottom is a cracker. On the top is either wine or juice. We ask everyone to come forward to receive uh, the elements, to hear a word of the gospel from those serving, and then to return to your seat with them. And at a later point in the service, I'll let you know we'll all commune together and take the elements at that time. We have some gluten-free options on the brown plates on each of the stations that you can take. We also have folks in the black, the the Shackleford's, who will be praying for us during this time. And if you would like to go back and join them in prayer or you have a prayer need, they would be happy to pray for you during this time. Um, One last thing. uh, If for one of the reasons I mentioned earlier, you don't feel comfortable taking the Lord's Supper today or you don't feel like you should, we want to encourage you to come forward anyway and hear a word of the gospel from those who are serving, but just don't receive the elements and then return to your seat. Uh, We want you to feel like you belong here, even though you may not believe at this time. So consider that today. So if you will, come and let us feast with the king.
You take, eat, remember, believe. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Take, drink, remember, believe. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, God, for this sacrament, for your kindness to leave it for us. We thank you that you commune with us and that this is not a memorial service, but a celebration with you of the great work that you've done in our lives. Help us, Father, pour your love into us that we may pour it into others. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and let's sing Thanksgiving for this. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Please be seated. Uh, one way that we see Jesus pouring his love into us and us conversely pouring it into others is in his generosity. Uh, we try to speak each week here a little bit about generosity and how generous Jesus is to us. You, you've, you've heard it in the sermon and a hundred other ways in the service today how Jesus is generous to us in the gospel, how he's given and given and given and given to us that we may give to others. And what I'd like to do today is just to celebrate for a moment how that has happened here in terms of it overflowing out into the church. Uh, in November, we had a deficit here of $50,000 going into the end of the year. And I want to, you to know today that uh, we started out in January with a surplus of $25,000. That is incredible. Uh, that your generosity, that, that comes from Jesus. I want you to understand that that generosity comes from Jesus' generosity in our lives. And let's continue to, to give thanks for what he's doing in us, for the resources that we have. I want to encourage you as the new year starts for you to think about maybe ways that you could not only give money here, but to give time to be able to give some of that precious resource to helping in various areas of ministry in the church. We'll give you some ways to think about that over the next few months. But for now, can I just pray and let's celebrate God's kindness. Let's pray together. Father, we are so thankful for your generosity to us. And I am so grateful for the work that you have done in the hearts of your people here to give uh, our little church uh, this uh, amazing, amazing uh, resource to be able to keep going. We thank you so much for the way that you've loved us and cared for us. We pray that you would continue to help open up our hearts uh, this year to being more and more generous because we see, we watch, and we see the generosity of Jesus. And we pray this in his name. 
Amen. Uh, at this time, we're going to pass uh, uh, the, the plate here in just a moment, some baskets. Uh, that's one way that you can give. You can also give by scanning the QR code in your bulletin. There are lots of ways that you can give financially, but also consider ways that you might be willing to give uh, your time. You can certainly go to the Got Questions table after worship today. There'll be someone there that would help you to think about maybe ways that you can use your gifts. So if you will, let's sing together our final hymn. Stand as we sing. Be thou my vision. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to be saved. heard the good news uh, this week of how uh, Jesus Christ pours his love into us that we may pour it into others. I pray that as you go out this week into your businesses, when you go back home, when you see your friends, when you see your neighbors, that you will have uh, a heart to encourage them, uh, to, uh, to share with them the love that has been given to you. In the meantime, hear this benediction from the Lord as we depart from 1 Thessalonians 5. May God himself the God who makes everything holy and whole, make you holy and whole. Put you together, spirit, soul, and body, and keep you fit for the coming of our master, Jesus Christ. And all the king's people said, amen. See you next Sunday night.